thank you all very much for coming, and thank you, Martin, for the, uh, for the invitation. So at Plantronics, as you might imagine, uh, first of all, for the few of you that don't know, Plantronics is the world's largest producer of intelligent headsets. In many respects, we consider ourselves the ultimate edge of the voice network. We're literally the last three inches that sits on your body and conveys all of this terrific, uh, all of this terrific voice information that uh, the other two speakers have been talking about. You know, the interesting thing for Plantronics, though, is as the piece of technology that sits on your body, we actually find ourselves in a position where we do deep research over the last 54 years on the actual human experience. How does the human consume voice? How is the human engaged? How does it all work? So actually, before I talk about the future of voice, because we watch WebRTC and SIP and all these other things very, very closely, I actually wanted to talk about the past of voice. When does voice work and when does voice not? So for us, the ultimate past of voice, I think we would all agree voice really works when it happens like this. Voice really works when it's three or four people around a table. But the interesting question is, why does voice work? Well, it works for a lot of reasons when you've got three or four people in a room. Clearly, it works for voice quality reasons. This is something we study a lot. It works for voice quality reasons. Clearly, when I'm sitting in a room with Martin and two or three other people, voice is in a position where it's full fidelity. Clearly, it's stereo. I'm hearing through both of my ears. I'm able to echolocate and do spatial audio by turning my head a little bit. There was a mention of video in the place it plays. Well, clearly, I'm able to get feedback from the different users in the room. I'm able to do things where I can actually scan the crowd. And your brain is actually an amazing DSP doing many things. I'm able to look around as I'm talking and intuitively see that this gentleman over here is very engaged. Thank you for that, by the way. I appreciate it. That's good. Yeah, he's really watching, so we're good. I'm connected with him. I don't really need to do too much else here, but no offense, but this lady over here is not really listening, so maybe I'll dig in a little bit, try and engage her. You know how to work the audience, and your brain's doing that the whole time. You're figuring out whether to talk slower or faster, louder, at, at all times. There's other things that your brain is doing in this situation. Many, many cues. I'm able to actually hear the air conditioner that's fairly loud in here, but this fabulous DSP called my brain turns it down. I don't really hear it. I just hear the three people that I'm talking to. The person that's walking out, because I am kind of boring, actually. Actually, their footsteps get turned down, and I'm focused on all of you instead. So the real question that we find ourselves with at Plantronics is, when, when the connection is broken, when we're on an audio call, and I think we've all experienced a narrow band audio call, how do, we, how do we reconstitute not only the fidelity, but all of the cues that happen in the room in order to create a true future of voice that is indeed as rich and natural as face-to-face? -face? So is video the answer is always a really, really interesting question that we deal with uh, along with everybody else. All right, and where do you click? There it is, good. So is video the answer? And actually, I would say it's not. Video makes it better, but who has ever been on a video conference and really forgotten that it was video? It's video, you're not in the room. Well, and you know you're not in the room because the cues aren't correct. You don't have perfect line of sight to the people you're talking to. It's better. You can see if they're nodding and if they're, and if they're crossing their arms. But you don't really get all of the cues. You get all of the sounds from the microphone in their room. You don't get to see the door that's behind them making the noise. You just get the noise and you're puzzled. So all of the cues aren't there from video. So how do we begin restoring truly voice to what it was? Well, first of all, there's some great technical innovations that help us as we go through all this. As has already been talked about, for the first time in the history of networks, for the hundred or so years that we've been doing voice and the 50 or so years that we've been doing data, we literally sit at the moment where the network is converged end to end for the first time. 
network is truly converged where we can do real, uh, we can do high definition stereo, real time voice, all the way from my ear through the headset, through the handset, across the network, and all the way to the other ear. But at the same time, because we're on a converged network, we have the ability to use things like the data channel and WebRTC or other technologies to send real-time contextual data that helps actually restore the full f fidelity of the conversation for people that are remote. But there's actually other technologies that help us too in this case. It's really cool. In addition to a converged network, boy, do we have devices. Something on the order of 50 billion ARM cores have shipped, several billion Intel compatible cores. That leads to somewhere in the 6 to 12 billion devices connected to the network range, somewhere in the few devices for every human being alive. Now those devices can help us in a few ways. Either they're literally a communications endpoint with WebRTC or other, uh, or other voice services. They also can be sensors sending cues to, uh, across the network, helping us understand the context that each person in a conversation is in. Now, this is just one. The other things that are available, and it's really interesting, I put this slide together for a reason. Actually, a couple of months ago, data can help us. Data can help us restore context. And you know a term's being overused when your mom asks about it. About two months ago, my 70-year-old mother asked me about big data. Wow. And she said, so this big data thing, I mean, it, it sounds big. How big is big data? And I said, well, Mom, let me think about that. Um, I said, I'll tell you what. And I did a little, a little clicking around on the internet, and I said, do you remember when you took me to the United States Library of Congress when I was a kid in Washington, D.C.? And this is a picture of it, by the way. And there's aisle after aisle of books and magazines out behind it. And I said, Mom, do you remember when we went? She said, yeah. I, she said, is it, is it that big? And I said, well, Mom, actually, if you take everything in the US Library of Congress and all the videos they've recorded over time, and you bring it all together, that's pretty big, right? Well, I said, well, right now, the internet actually has about 18 million libraries of Congress worth of data in it, doubling every 18 months. So we got about 72 million libraries of Congress worth of data on the internet by 2017. All of that data being available to actually help us have contextual, relevant remote communication sessions. So we're on a perfect storm of technology now where we have a relatively infinite, uh, ever faster, ever more wireless network pipe. We have a cloud with 72 million uh, libraries of Congress worth of data. We have analytics engines plowing through all that data, not only to find meaning, but to increasingly find it in real time, all potentially being at the beck and call of an intelligent, of an intelligent audio device sitting on the person. So how do we see all this playing out? What are the experiments we're doing? What are we working with our top customers to bring all this together into a different future of voice story? Well, we really think the world going forward looks a bit like this. We think we're going to be in a world where as we're all walking around connected with our high-definition headset on, the mobile devices that are on us, that we're also going to be operating with the billions and billions of sensors that are going to be on the street, in the cafe, on the bus, all tied to the cloud, so we can do very interesting things. Even in this particular, uh, particular picture, I'll give you an example. We see a future where as the bus is coming down the road, we're able to actually understand its progress from the sensors as it's coming, as it's coming towards us and actually do a more intelligent sound suppression of the bus. We're able to tell of the people that are walking around on the street that this particular gentleman is with me, part of the conversation, and his voice should not be canceled. It should be transmitted to the other end, while everybody else should indeed be suppressed in the name of noise privacy. So we see a world where all this is happening very, very quickly, and the pieces are coming into place. 
So with all of this, we can indeed create much more contextual conversations. We can create a conversation where literally by the time we actually launch an application, one of these highly specialized voice applications that the other speakers talked about, we can literally convey the context to the other end of why I'm calling, what I would like from the other person, and literally what I'm feeling. So I would like the person on the other end to know that I'm calling because my dad has fallen down and I'm highly, highly emotionally disturbed at the moment. I need help badly. I'd like the person to know that I'm calling to order groceries and they're able to go, yeah, I can look at your order from before. Let's do this quicker. We think we're at the edge of making all this work. So indeed, our belief is that the future of communications is the blending of many things. We think it's analytics, next-gen voice, contextually aware wearable devices, cloud, ubiquitous networks that we work so hard on uh, uh, here, WebRTC and other things, all coming together. But the key to the future of voice and all that, in particular, is indeed, we think, the ultimate voice endpoint is indeed body-worn devices that are able to create a full fidelity audio connection, are able to help with smarter working by intelligently uh, providing sound masking and audio privacy, intelligently actually block other sounds out and whatnot as you go, combined with sensors and biometrics to help actually push environmental and emotional factors through the network to help the people on the other end really understand the world that we're in. And we really think when you bring all that together, adapt it to the person and the vertical, then indeed you actually wind up with the future of voice. So little different extreme user angle, but this is the research and the angle that we're coming at. And we really believe that to the extent that we all work together to solve these problems for the end user and really restore all of the emotional and social cues of face-to-face -face communication, we're truly going to have the future of voice and end users are, uh, are going to be willing to reward us all for it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.